respectfully acknowledge that I live, work and play on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh tooth nations. And that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the territory of the Musqueam people. I know that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, uh, please note this event is being recorded for public use and will be posted on the website of the college and you will receive a link after it has been posted. And uh, uh, most of you probably know that we will have a business meeting for the first 15 minutes of this session and then a presentation by Judy Ills with questions and answers. So uh, again, uh, you can use the chat button to ask questions. So we'll think, see my slide. This constitutes the principal's report uh, for our uh, second business meeting of the year. And uh, this year, uh, being as the uh, college was uh, four years old and coming out of uh, the pandemic, uh, we held a strategic planning retreat in September that involved the college council and leaders of clusters and committees. And at this, we agreed on four priorities and four groups have formed to determine the activities that we will undertake over the next three years to achieve positive outcomes uh, for these priorities. Now, my slide uh, shows these four priorities and I'm gonna report on some of the activities uh, related to these. The first is to enrich retirement for college members, which is the aim of our programs and special interest groups. In terms of the programs, this year we were invited to partner with the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies on their Climate and Nature Emergency Program. We've had three superb talks thus far with per perspectives being presented by faculty from political science, health and forestry. Upcoming in January, a professional engineering perspective will be presented by David Wilkinson. If you haven't yet taken advantage of this very interesting program, I encourage you to do so. We also continue our partnership with Green College. This year's series is Disciplines Over Time, which but at different stages of their careers to talk about how the boundaries separating their field of specialization from other fields has changed over time. Thus far, we've heard from geography, English, and upcoming in January will be nursing. Again, this is a very thought provoking program. I extend thanks to Olive Slaybaker for organizing the Peter Wall program, Don Fisher for the Green College program, Sandra Bressler for our general meetings, and Carolyn Gilbert for overall coordination of all of these events as program cluster leader. In terms of our special interest groups, we now have nine groups with uh, wine appreciation being the newest led by uh, Emeritus Professor uh, David MacArthur from the Faculty of Land and Food Systems and a wine scientist. David offers an exceptionally informative uh, program which a number of people must know about because we reached the quota for participants within two days after this opportunity was posted. I thank Paul Steinbach, who leads the travel group for being willing to take on oversight of the activities cluster as cluster leader. And I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Graham Wynn, our past principal, who encouraged the development of the wine appreciation, women's co-housing and volunteer groups and leads the growth of academe and cycling groups. So Graham's been a huge promoter of activity within the college. Secondly, we want to increase the community profile and involvement of the college and its members uh, at all levels. In terms of increasing involvement in the community, the volunteering special interest group led by Nancy Galini has been establishing links with organizations who offer volunteering opportunities. And we're looking at ways of passing this information on to you. Part of this priority is that we know that many of you are already making significant and important contributions in the community, but these contributions are not widely known. So we're uh, setting about to ask you uh, and, aim in, and, and we're aiming to increase the communication about your contributions. 
Similarly, our next uh, priority is to enhance recognition of the relevance and benefits of Meritai and the college to the university. Here, we see a need to increase our interactions with deans and department heads, which I now uh, realize uh, have a fair bit of uh, say in uh, uh, UBC uh, uh, workings. Uh, we want them to know about the college and the contributions made by Emeriti before the new president, provost, and vice provost academic assume their positions in the next one to two years. So we would really appreciate hearing from those of you who have been deans and department heads about what would have helped you to have a positive view of the college and Emeriti and what, what we might be able to do to sell uh, the college to them. You'll also have seen in the last email alert from the office that we posted the call for nominations for our two annual awards for Emeriti, the Award of Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors, recognizes UBC Emeriti for their uh, excellence in innovative research, artistic creation, or new applications of previous research since obtaining emeritus status. The, uh, and then we, the second award is the UBC President's Award for Distinguished Service, which honors UBC Emeriti who have displayed exceptional leadership in uh, voluntary uh, community services. The nominations are due uh, February 15th, so there's a good amount of time to uh, think uh, either of nominating yourself or uh, deserving colleagues. Now, um, central to these three priorities is to ensure that the college is effective, efficient, and sustainable. And it's really here that your contribution as a volunteer will keep the college running. It's not a life sentence, and nor it is, is the work onerous. Um, and for me, it's about being able to contribute and the opportunity to get to know people from so many different disciplines and with such amazing ranges of expertise and experience. You can get to know each other a little bit better in special interest groups, coming together with a shared interest and contributing to group activities. But we've all suffered from not being able to rub shoulders and connect with others at our program meetings over these last uh, three years. So keep in mind that the college has a lot of committees and becoming a committee me member gives you uh, the chance to get involved in a group, gives you some work to do. And uh, this can include identifying speakers for programs like this or deliberating on nominees for our two annual awards. We're also currently uh, in the search for somebody uh, to lead the editorial group for the college newsletter. There's a steady stream of articles coming to the office. Uh, we set up a template for the newsletter and we're gonna contract out to UBC services to design and publish the document. But there's a real need for a lead editor. So if you've got a love of language, are obsessed with grammar, have an eye for detail, it would be great to hear from you about getting involved. I must thank Carolyn Gilbert, who has had a significant role in editing most of the college documents these past years, including the proposal for the Peter Wall uh, Climate Program and currently our strategic plan. And all of these have been considerably improved by her thoughtful review and input. Finally, as members, we volunteer our time and we're critically dependent upon our two staff, one of whom is days away from retiring herself. This will be Christina Girardi's last meeting after four years as an office administrator. And I invite you to give her a round of applause. I think we have to unmute everything, uh, or you can raise your or uh, you, uh, the college. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina. So I'll uh, end my bit and ask if there's any questions or comments. Jim. No, sorry, I was just uh, mistaken then. You know what, I've got my little um, pointer, it turns into a hand when it goes over somebody. So I thought you had your hand. <laughs> and I can only see so many people, uh, Sandra, so you'll have to say if there's any hands up. If not, then I will hand it to Sandra to introduce our guest speaker.
Thank you, Anne. Uh, it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Uh, Judy Illis. Dr. Illis is a world-renowned rena pioneer of the field of neuroethics. She is co-lead of the Canadian Brain Re Research Strat Strategy and chair this year of the International Brain Initiative. She sits on numerous boards, including as vice chair of the Institute Advisory Board of CIHR's Institute for Neuroscience, Mental Health and Addiction, and as a director at large of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Judy is often asked to provide expert consultation and testimony on ethics matters involving conflict of interest, neuroprivacy, and ownership of research, data, governance, and regulation. She received the Order of Canada, the country's highest citizen award in 2017, and is the first UBC Distinguished Scholar in neuro Neuroethics. Her topic today is, that, is aligning innovations in neuroscience with social, cultural, and individual human values through high, excuse me, high impact <laughs> research, education, and outreach. And I'm going to remind you again that, uh, that you're very welcome to enter uh, questions in the chat. Uh, there will be the question and answer period after, as Anne said. So I will turn the meeting over to you, Judy. Sandra, thank you so much. And hello, everyone. I am I'm really very honored to be invited to give this lecture to the Emeritus College AGM. I'm, uh, I have to say, I, I'm not usually in intimidated by uh, my audience, but uh, you are an intimidating audience. And I also recognize some of my dear friends, Alice and Eddie. I, I don't know if you're in Ottawa now or where you are. It's so good to see you. Uh, Ralph Matthews, I, I see you in a thumbnail on my screen and a lot of this content will be familiar to you. Um, and others, Judy Hall is here. Judy Hall is um, chair of the advisory board of Neuroethics Canada and an unfailing supporter of all that the work that we do. So I'm really, I'm so deeply grateful to be able to speak with you this afternoon, to share a little bit about what I do in neuroethics and um, engage with you in a conversation. So I'm gonna share my screen now and bring my slides up. I presume you can see them. I'm gonna go into full screen mode. And I'm just going to ask someone to give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen. Very good. All right. So um, Sandra um, was very interested in, in having me um, speak about what neuroethics is and how to and what I mean, what we mean when we're talking about neuroethics and aligning human values with neuroscience research. So I have to say I, I was um, uh, stumped by how to go ahead with this lecture because there's so much I could talk about. Uh, Judy Hall and I spoke a little bit about um, repurposing my Vancouver Institute lecture, but I really wanted to do something new for you because I know many of you um, attended the Vancouver Institute lecture uh, in early October. And so I want to show you something very different. And I suppose what I've chosen to show you comes from a topic that I'm just extremely excited about now and have been working on in some detail, both in the past uh, with Ralph Matthews and uh, now reignited in, into the present. So we're gonna go in a number of different directions, but I really wanna acknowledge my amazing young team of researchers, some of whom are shown here on this slide. This is just post uh, COVID. Uh, we're about 30 people now situated between uh, two sites uh, in uh, UBC Hospital, BC Children's Hospital. We've now opened two uh, satellite sites in the University of Winnipeg, as well as in Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. So we are an expanding team. Uh, and here, of course, in Vancouver, we um, are very grateful to be able to do our work on the lands of the Coast Salish people. And I don't, many of you are tuning in from different locations across Canada and 
I invite you to think about the lands on which you're working and enjoying your retirement and your emeritus status um, and um, and the opportunity to, to thrive where, where you are across Canada. So what I'd like to do is talk about environmental neuroethics today. There's gonna to be a lot of content, um, but I think it really brings together human values with science. And I'm gonna have a lot of content to share with you, but we'll, we'll get through it and there'll be plenty of time for conversation. So we'll talk a little bit first about what neuroethics is as the foundation and what I mean by environmental neuroethics as the spe specialization within this content area. Then I'm gonna give you two case studies, one a little bit longer than the other. And the longer one is um, uh, on adverse environments. It's a little bit dark. I beg your forgiveness in advance. And then we'll end on a much happier note around what uh, neuroscience and enhanced environments might look like and how what the meaning of that is for the neuroethics space. And we'll sort of wax uh, hopefully, happily about the future to come. So what are we talking about when we think about neuroethics? Fundamentally, we're talking about aligning discoveries about the brain with the changes that they're bringing to individuals, communities, and societies, whether we're talking about our homes, our workplaces, our student classrooms, um, our courtrooms, um, the ethical and legal social implications of all that advances in neuroscience are bringing us. And through neuroethics, we really do, do draw upon many modern ethics frameworks. And here are just a few. And if we just start at the top, utilitarianism, of course, refers to the um, biggest bang for the buck, the most benefit for the most number of people. A principalism you might well be familiar with beneficence, non-maleficence. We think about Hipp Hippocratic Oath. We think about caring for other people in when we think about the ethics of care. Um, as neuroethicists, we build on ethics that have to do with the rights of people, including disability rights, communitarianism, the social order, and what does it mean to have rights and ethics of a community, not just uh, individual Western ethics and individual autonomy uh, ethics and pragmatism. So we're very pragmatic in our neuroethics work. And what do I mean by that? And what do I mean by that, let's say, as it pertains to the environment? Well, we tend to be very anticipatory, very proactive, and fundamentally solution-oriented. And I think that's a departure from uh, older school philosophical bioethics uh, that tends to be more theoretical. We tend to really be science-based with always solutions in mind as we go ahead. Uh, we again are very empirical. Our work here at UBC and among our colleagues who um, share with us the philosophy about evidence-based medicine and evidence-based uh, methods uh, and results, we think about that um, um, more than um, moral and political principles and strategies for thinking about content areas. Uh, we're very attuned to the context of behavior uh, in the changing environment. And uh, we very much embrace pluralism and multidirectional and inclusive deliberations. And so much of our work is focused on plural, plural, plurality, plurality and uh, what I have called cross-cultural neuroethics. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. So what do we mean by neuroethics, like environmental neuroethics as the specialization of neuroethics? that brings together human values with brain sciences. Well, um, as I said before, we will talk about um, both positive cases and negative, well, negative cases and positive cases, and neither is absolute, but we're really thinking about environmental change and specifically how it's impacting human brain and behavior, human neurological and mental health. Um, and I thank Ralph Matthews in particular for teaching me about how environmental, how environment can be construed as a social process, a social construction of space and place, and the landscape in terms of how we as humans value it. And when we think about environmental ethics and all that we need to draw upon from environmental ethics that precedes us, we think about the relationship of the environment and how it's used appropriately. 
And I think we have seen, as Olson in 1992 and others have said, or have, have reflected that societies have moved from focusing on um, valuing the environment in, time, in terms of how we use it to actually valuing it uh, in its own right. And in the health context, we think about uh, the means of assessing and correcting, controlling, um, and even preventing adverse factors that could adversely affect the environment, and as a consequence or as an extension, adversely affect the health of present and future generations. Um, and also, again, and I nod towards Professor Matthews, um, we have learned through our, our scholarship about ecological knowledge as it pertains to environment and neuroethics and how the spiritual dimension of the environment, which sometimes feels inaccessible to science, plays really a vital role in shaping perceptions and actions and how we must take the spirit and spiritual beliefs into account when we discuss, think about, and attend to uh, environmental change. So this brings me to some research that I started in about 2009, 2010, and that I conducted for seven years uh, uh, through 20, about 2017 actively uh, in collaboration and co-creation with the Taltan First Nation, which is shown here in Northern BC in that little black square. And I'll just say that we retain excellent relationships with this nation to date. And we have recently, the Taltan Nation and Dr. Lynn Beatty, uh, who's also a member of the Emeritus College and myself, recently won an award from a Seattle-based foundation for the work that we did jointly and how it um, emphasized trust and grew trust together in the research process in the work that we did together. The focus of that research was understanding um, why and how these uh, has affected the community, this Northern community. They have an autosomal dominant disease, a gene for uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease. And through our work, which is a completely separate topic or separate lecture in its fullness, we learned that um, there really is the possibility to realize two eyed seeing in the in the way that indigenous people have described it and shared it with us. And that um, there really can be a coexistence between traditional knowledge and bio biomedical knowledge of diseases like early onset Alzheimer's disease that has a genetic con component. It's the PS1 gene that predisposes uh, individuals uh, with the gene to the disease. And through our many, many years of work together, and here you see many of the themes that we derived through focus groups and interviews with members of the nation over time, we found, had this really surprising finding, and it had to do with the connection of the land. And it came out in about 4% of the data that we collected with this group. And you could say, well, Judy, 4% of the data, what that's, what's, you know, what is that really about? But it turns out it was very, very valuable as a collateral finding in our results about how to bring and understand and co-create knowledge about uh, this form of Alzheimer's disease, disease among the community in whom little was understood about the disease and there had been a great deal of fractured knowledge from generation to generation. Um, but one of the, one, the connection to the land that we heard from them was the deep connection with the environment. As this quote here from one of our uh, participants, our partners uh, shared with us, I am part of my environment. And if my environment suffers, I suffer. And, um, and even more telling, and I think this is really what turned us on to the idea of an environmental neuroethics line of inquiry, is that they've been doing a lot of mining and I heard that it's affecting them, like making them rotten inside. So we have a connection of genes and land all coming together into a belief system um, that um, we believe, um, and, and they, the nation has shared with us, changed the whole landscape, no pun intended, around stigma and understanding um, from one that was really very negative to one 
um, that could really bring and shape wellness into the community to the extent that that was possible. So moving out of the community, we took this idea and with Ralph comes back again in this lecture, uh, we published um, uh, first a, a letter to President, then President Obama's presidential commission that was working on neuroscience issues. And we said, you know, we think there's really something here and we're calling it environmental neuroethics. And it's really a focus on how the environment that's changing in both good and bad ways is actually changing the brain. And we think it's something you ought to take up. Um, and we weren't alone in this idea. Around this time, uh, there was a lot of activity around screen time in children. And of course, Judy Hall, chair, a former chair of pediatrics would have been keenly interested in this. And Alison Eddy, of course, uh, we started seeing some work on the effect of pesticides on the brain. And even one of my undergraduate students, a very brilliant student, did some research on the effects of methylmercury in the water on, uh, on neurological changes. And then a very strange thing happened. Oh, wait, before I tell you about the strange thing, through this work, we created a framework for thinking about environmental neuroethics. And here it had five parts, and you see it here. Um, and you see that it really draws on the ethics frameworks that I shared with you earlier. Brain science, fundamentally, uh, how neuroscience discovery is linking to the environment and brain and mental health, how people are connected with one another, the importance of culture, indigeneity, traditional understandings play a role in understanding the environment and environmental change. Of course, social policies and distributive justice are fundamental in all of these discussions, as are the importance and something I'm deeply committed to, which is public discourse and outreach and bringing the public into conversations with us about the kind of both fundamental neuroscience and ethics work that we're doing. So um, this is where things went dark. So I, I don't actually know what happened and I don't know if this was a political problem or we were just prescient with our thinking about the brain and the environment, but things went quiet in this space for five years. We could not uh, get any funding to think about environmental neuroethics. And um, there were no, there were very few publications. It just had this big vacuum. And um, I was a little despondent, but not, not too despondent because sometimes when you have a good idea, you just have to wait, as all of you know, for it to come around for its time to be right. And it did. And it came back in 2021, where the National Academies of, of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, the United States, created a workshop around the environment and mental health. To me, that's environmental neuroethics. Uh, the International Neuroethics Society uh, focused on environmental neuroethics in its meeting last year. So all of a sudden, there's this activity that's come back. Very exciting. And so we're now starting to follow in this path. And our key motivating questions to date, although I'm sure there'll be others that evolve, are what are really the bridges between existing and new areas of inquiry in the environment, ethics, and brain and mental health? And how do we think about indicators for this area of inquiry, both in terms of where we ought to go, as well as the impact that we're making, if any, uh, as, as we proceed with our research? So we um, started to embark on those questions using uh, a, a, a review of, um, of the mining literature, the fracking literature prompted by our, our partners uh, in the Taltan First Nation. And um, all of you know, I'm sure that uh, mining and shale gas fracking are really um, big contributors to environmental change, not only in our province, in Alberta and across uh, Canada and uh, British Columbia has uh, plenty of uh, shale gas uh, to go around. And um, you know, fracking involves pushing uh, large quantities of um, uh, chemical fueled water into the ground and pushing up, um, uh, pushing up oil and gas from the earth. Um, and it um, uh, came to the attention of the Canadian expert panel in uh, 2014 and was really quite an area of focus 
And so Ralph and I, together with Dr. Robillard, who's also faculty at Neuroethics Canada, uh, published a, an op-ed in uh, the Vancouver Sun with this, I think, catchy title, uh, Why We Should Be Thinking About Environmental Neuroethics. But we weren't the only ones publishing in the mass media. And here you see just some, some clippings from other news uh, entities that were starting to think about the health effects of fracking, both uh, in the brain and mental health arena, but also more, more broadly. Um, so, um, and then just recently, CBC uh, published this uh, headline, Significant Back-to-Back -back Earthquakes in Northern BC, very likely caused by fracking. So there seems to be a lot going on in this space, uh, and all the more reason for us to be really thinking about it, again, in a very anticipatory and solution-oriented way. So uh, we conducted uh, several years ago a, peer, an, a systematic review of the peer-reviewed and gray uh, literature, uh, six years of uh, data. And just in the past two weeks with my uh, researchers, Ava, Ava Greer and uh, Ala Yeshia, uh, we just updated the data with another five years of, um, of research up to actually just, um, just a few days ago. So 2022 is not quite complete yet. And so our search involved these terms that you see here, every iteration of unconventional natural gas you can think of, every version of brain and neuro you can think of, and then a number of secondary terms like culture and first nations and health and celestalgia um, to actually see what people have been writing. And in the original review that we published, uh, we found 106 sources that met our eligibility criteria literature, 23 from the gray literature. And now in the, this just recently updated uh, database, we found 75 articles. So there's less, there's really less, both in the peer reviewed literature and only about 50% of the number of writings in the gray literature. Still the distribution is same in terms of where they're coming from, but there is notably fewer in the past five or six years. Uh, the big big contributors are USA and Canada, as one, one might predict. Um, what do the data look like? Well, we um, examined, we interrogated the literature for um, mentions about brain and fracking and environment and ethics for the number of times that there was it was mentioned in an article that is just like a, in a list, number of times it was uh, discussed briefly, like a little bit more than a list, but not really substantially. And when we saw actually a substantive fulsome discussion of an ethics related issue. And I, I would submit to you that the data here shown on the left originally, and now the updated data on the right, look pretty much the same. There's a preponderance of list making, so nodding towards brain and environment and ethics, but not really a um, uh, any substantive discussion, either either brief or substantive. So I have to say we were a little disappointed to find that, but um, not entirely disappointed. And let me show you why. Um, but before I do that, these are just the general topics we see in the literature. Parkinson's disease is related to manganese. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is as related to a number of environmental exposures, psychological impacts, and here are the predictably, predictably big ones. Um, and the recent data, we did find an, a focus on neurodevelopmental disorders that we did not note in the original database, uh, specifically pertaining to neural tube defects, uh, hyperactivity disorder in children, as well as autism. What do the ethics data look like? Well, in the original data set, um, and our coding allows for multiple codes. So even though these happens to add up to 106, not all papers contained these ethics themes, but um, in papers, papers might have gotten multiple codings because they did contain uh, different kinds, different kinds of themes and multiple themes. So we say we see safety was mentioned pretty pretty often in 60% of the literature in the original database. And the smattering of other ethics concerns, again, uh, mentioned, but not necessarily discussed. And these are topics like trust and vulnerability, precautionary principle, and so forth. Interestingly, in the new data, we find, again, safety. We found the same ethics concepts as before. 
We found, found some papers that had no ethics content whatsoever. And we're now starting to see a discourse, a substantive discourse around something that is being called environmental racism. And environmental racism pertains to really an institutional racism where landfills and incinerators and hazardous waste are being placed in and around communities of color. And this, uh, to our knowledge, had not been discussed before or before this period of analysis. And in fact, um, in uh, several years ago, there was even a push uh, in Canada around an Environmental Racism Act, Bill C-230, that called for the Federal Minister of Environmental Chain and Climate Change to examine the link between essentially uh, SES, poverty, race, uh, and environmental risks and develop a strategy to mitigate it. I can tell you that this uh, bill fell flat in 2021. It was tabled twice, uh, but never actually saw the light of day, which I think for Canadians is really quite disappointing. Um, so if I were to summarize these data for you, both our primary work with the Taltan First Nation jointly with them, and in our literature review, I think we're really seeing that um, fracking and oil and gas extraction is a threat to human rights. Kern said it 12 years ago, and I think uh, it stands today. There's really both direct and indirect impacts on neurological mental health. Um, there's a lack of trust and increased a lack of public acceptance that we see that's promoted through uh, the news media. Um, and there is a suggestion from our data that there's an inability of Indigenous people to maintain their existing and traditional practices and way in life because of the encroachment of these industries uh, onto their lands. Um, and I'll just share with you that I, um, the Vancouver International Mountain Festival is going on now. For those of you who have a subscription or those of you who might be interested in a subscription, uh, it's very inexpensive and there's a full length documentary called The Kabunka Keepers. And it uh, is a documentary on the Taltan First Nation resisting the encroachment of the mining industry on their lands and the development of the Red Chris Mine, or has, um, which they successfully resisted. And then uh, uh, several years after the making of this film came to agreement with the mining industry to, um, to put the mine there and enhance the economic uh, situation uh, around their area in Northern BC. And I, I urge you to watch it. It's a very beautiful and meaningful film. It speaks to many of the issues that I just shared with you now. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath and I'm gonna go on to what I think is a, a much lighter and happier story than the dark one I've just shared with you. Although I hope that um, in sharing the data with you that I did, we, we look towards ways that we can remediate and mitigate uh, adverse effects of exposures uh, and um, think about how we can make the environment better for brain and mental health. Um, I suppose here is one way, and the one way is by enhancing the environments around us. And um, here is a, I'm sorry, it's a fuzzy picture, but um, this is sort of a friendly, inclusive space. It's actually not far from my house where people in wheelchairs and other disabilities can access the beach off of Kitts Point uh, on a, a sort of a friendly mat when, and it works when it's not windy. It doesn't work so well when it is windy, but the intention is awfully good. Um, it's to be inclusive. But what we really want is for people with disabilities, uh, whether they're motor disabilities or brain and mental health disabilities, to feel fully integrated with their environments. And there's a whole new movement now within the environmental neuroethics space that we are calling neuroarchitecture, to create spaces that have clear circulation and attend to social and memory and mood and learning features of people um, from diverse backgrounds and diverse um, living situations. And um, we're very excited about this. And so there's a new book that's just coming out that I've edited called Neurodivergence and Architecture. It's a very nice chapter by my uh, undergraduate student, Camille uh, Huang, on the neuroethics of architecture. And in this chapter, we describe the neuroethics hows of brain-based architecture. 
So what are we talking about? We're talking about understanding how the brain responds to built spaces, appreciating how neurological diversity actually impacts the res these responses, how spaces can actually be designed to serve uh, diverse neurologic needs. I said five, there's only four, and actually promoting wellness by thinking about what we know, how the brain is organized and how it can promote good and healthy and fully integrated spaces uh, for people from diverse backgrounds, not just ones that are either make a nod to inclusivity or are friendly, but only modestly effective. And so how do we connect the brain and the environment? We connect it by sensing material cues like shape and materials and symbols, and we consolidate them into the, our impressions and our experience. We know that experience goes both directions. As we experience, we feed back to the environment and it becomes altered. And ultimately the brain is intimately connected to the body and uh, through epigenetics, uh, our experiences are passed down from generation to generation. Um, and I just, I just love this figure by Bauer where he maps different kinds of uh, space uh, in terms of furniture actually with where it lies in the brain. And this is all derived from different kinds of imaging modalities of the brain, whether it's electrical signals or um, the way the brain is oxygenated and how the blood flows and how it can be measured. And you really see the, the incredible connectivity among different er brain areas related to form, the appreciation of form and geometry, in the context of furniture and style, heights and enclosures, and even materials and textures. So it's all really connected. And um, we looked at the literature and we were really uh, interested to see whether the literature has, how it started to attend to brain environment connections. And we see this huge jump since 1990, 1999, I'll say in journal papers and even in other kinds of gray literature starting to attend to uh, uh, cognitive emotional components in architectural design. So there's really something going on here that's pretty exciting. And um, here's some images of new architectures that have explicitly taken into consideration the organization of the brain and cognition. Uh, this is the Orchard Res uh, Respite Center, um, serves people uh, with Alzheimer's disease and space is very open and very flat and accessible, very well lit. Uh, here is a, also an Alzheimer's Center in um, Ohio. And if you just follow it with me, um, here you see, and I think you can see my cursor. If not, you can see the shaded areas on the bottom of the drawing um, where the rooms for residents are, the center space that is for gathering and um, interior paths for walking. And there are very few corners here. And the idea is that no matter where you walk, you don't bump into a corner and that you can easily navigate your yourself back to square one if in fact you have lost your sense of direction or directionality. Um, there's also been a neuro architecture that has focused on people with post-traumatic uh, stress disorders, extremely interesting work um, that has really focused on what is called in this literature, trauma-informed design, focusing on safety where people with uh, PTSD um, have clear sight lines, which apparently is very important to them, well-lit or even dimly lit spaces, depending on the kind of traumas they've experienced, why corridors seem to be very important to this cohort of individuals with um, uh, mental health um, challenges. Um, natural light is important, as is natural materials. Um, you know, reduction, explicit reduction of adverse stimuli and stressors the environment. Um, and on the right of the slide, you see themes of coherence, de-escalation and empowerment, really focusing on the autonomy of the individual and restoring the autonomy of individuals with PTSD around logical arrangements of spaces that um, are simple and clear, um, that can be um, give people access to quiet rooms where they may be in distress, um, and also empower them 
uh, to participate in design features of spaces, um, supporting them to make decision making, to make decisions about design, and also supporting them to be able to create flexible spaces or move their spaces around um, when uh, they they feel the need to move their spaces around and offer them multiple paths to a destination, for example. Uh, here in Holland is a beautiful architectural space that focuses on children. You see the lighting and the color on the left side of this slide, on the interior, on the right, the beautiful greenery surrounding this space. Uh, in Japan, here are some designs that are truly um, corner free for children, a focus particularly those on neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and you see how it, the space is really lit and moves and allows children to find their autonomy and freedom within it. And there are even specialized toilets for them in this particular space, which I think are both just um, wonderful, if, if not delightful in, in their own special way. And um, I, I just think this um, uh, neuro movement in neuroarchitecture, environmental uh, environment, neuro environmental neuroethics is is exciting. It's beautiful. It's also extremely complex. And perhaps the greatest complexity, as Tom Albright would say, and he wrote uh, in the foreword to the book that we just published, is that everyone's perception of beauty is different. And so how to bring that together uh, is is challenging and maybe one of the greatest challenges that um, we all we all face. So if we think about the future, we come back to the key motivating questions and I'll reiterate them. What are the bridges between existing and new areas of inquiry environment as it intersects with ethics and brain and mental health? And we come back to the framework. So I, I hope I've I've connected the research that we've done with the Taltan First Nation, with our literature reviews, and now with our uh, new work around uh, neuroarchitecture and the environmental in the, in the environmental neuroethics space that has really brought in each of these features of the framework. We always come back and revisit them and we like to update them. And I welcome your feedback as to whether something here needs to be refined or tweaked pulled out and others uh, added. This is really a moment of evolution in this field. And it, it's, it's joyous to be able to share our thinking with you. And, and this framework, it has stood for a number of years. And um, uh, if it needs updating, I'm, I'm all in. Um, so what are the key ind indicators for the future in this space? Well, I think it's openness to new ideas and ideologies, uh, evidence-based action that's really our focus, and it's a special focus now in this age of misinformation and fake news, we have to stay focused on the data and the evidence. And then always expanding the alignment of human values and innovations with this, our society, our cultures, and our individual human values, um, and using research and education and outreach to achieve that alignment. And with that, I conclude and I open this discussion up to the floor and I thank you for being here with me and I look forward to engaging with you now. Thank you so much. Excuse me, thank you so much, Judy. I see we have some questions in the chat, so I'm just going to read them. <laughs> now, this one, I think, is so timely and so interesting. What does yesterday's Alberta earthquake mean? Uh, so I have been completely overloaded with work, and I'm tell me about Alberta's earthquake yesterday. It's news as I'm catching up with the world. Okay. So um, Priscilla, um, fill Priscilla. me in. Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay, Hello. Uh, I heard this on the CBC. I think it was yesterday morning. I'm sure a lot of other people were will have heard it. And and uh, it was just that I just caught it before I was busy with other things myself. 
And uh, they said that it was uh, about 5.5 on the Richter scale, which is very significant for that part of our country, that uh, it's been some decades, I've forgotten how many since anything that serious happened, and that it was in the neighborhood of fracking activity. So um, what can I say? There may indeed be a relationship. Um, I'm not sure I know how to answer what, what does it mean other than um, we ought to be attending to um, uh, either causal or, cor or correlational relationships between um, earthquakes and what's going on in, in the in the industry. In terms of my brain, <laughs> on my emotional reaction, I'm very upset. How can how can we express ourselves? How upset we are. Um, so, Priscilla, I hope you're not upset at my lecture, but you're oh, upset no. <laughs> at the relationships <laughs> between... It's a beautiful lecture, and sorry, the first question <laughs> should contain the information that it was indeed a very nice lecture. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think, um, I think it's a question of taking hold of being upset uh, and reaching out uh, through op-eds to our policymakers, um, and, um, uh, you know, making our voices heard and, and continuing to attend to where we think there are, you know, directly linked relationships and, um, uh, you know, not, not being silent. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, Graham, um, thank you. I'm looking to where you are so I can see you. And I'll read Graham's, um, uh, question. Sure. Interesting that you find environmental racism as a recent focus. Robert Bullard, Dumping in Dixie, Land, in, in Dixie, published in 1990, is widely cited in the environmental history, environmental community, environmentalist community as a foundation statement, re-environmental racism, as you defined in your 26, 2016 to 2022 literature survey. So, um, Graham, thank you for the comment. And what's really important when I give lectures is I learn something while I'm doing it. And you can be sure I'm going to um, pull this right back up and read it. Uh, what can I tell you? It We just hadn't seen it as a focus uh, and a, a focus of discourse as we are seeing it now. And um, I'm I'm grateful for this reference that I'm very excited to read about. Um, is there something, um, I, I think you, no, you're not on mute. Do you want to weigh in and share with us more about um, what Bullard spoke about in this uh, in this book? Uh, Robert Bullard uh, really tracked exactly what you were pointing to as environmental racism, uh, the location of various forms of noxious industry uh, and waste disposal sites in areas of the American South. So uh, the notorious concentration of, um, of oil processing plants along the Mississippi River uh, and, and other such places, which are very heavily uh, occupied by uh, African Americans uh, and uh, poor individuals, but uh, certainly racialized for the most part. and. Uh, Bullard clearly indicated that there were specific reasons for these locations, that uh, the communities were not able to rise in protest, that everyone realized that these were noxious activities, but they wanted to put them somewhere. So why not slam them down where uh, the people who were affected were not likely to make much noise about it? So it's it's a a sad and sorry story, uh, but it really is taken among the environmental history community in North America as a foundational statement of uh, work in environmental injustice or environmental racism. And that's been a pretty, uh, 
pretty notable thread of, of work in the field. A lot of people associate environmental history mm -hmm. with wilderness and um, yeah. landscape change, and those kinds of things. But there is this, this alternative uh, or parallel stream that has been very, very much focused on environmental racism. You know, it's uh, so I, I want again. I want to thank you for the reference, and I um, snuck a note to myself uh, while while you were speaking to um, uh, to pick up uh, this this. Um, uh, it, it's a I don't know if it's a book or a, a paper. It, it's a book. It's a book. Um, excellent. And it, it's been republished uh, at least three times. I mm -hmm. think the third the third edition was in two thousand. So, uh, okay. if I remember, so that's a measure of how interested people were okay. in it's it's three three editions in in a decade. Yeah, very nice. Um, you know, one thing that we've been debating, Graham, and and this is really open for all of us for discussion in my group, as to whether environmental racism is the right term, or environmental injustice is the right term. Um, with the distinction being, um, you know, we're we're all you know affected by adverse impact on the environment. And it's an adjust, injustice to all people, but the environmental racism component is specifically focused on putting at risk people from marginalized, putting people from marginalized communities at extra risk, and that racial component really requires its own its own. Do in in this nineteen ninety. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think the one of the implications of Bullard's work is that uh, because environmental history uh, is very heavily concentrated in North America, its practitioners are heavily focused on North America. Um, the the implications of environmental injustice or environmental racism in places such as Southern Africa have received comparatively little attention from North mm. American scholars. Uh, but clearly it has been a huge issue in apartheid mm. South Africa and, and elsewhere. And I can send you something, Judy, uh, a recent book that has uh, just appeared this last summer, uh, has, oh, a, has a kind of review essay on the, the Southern African situation. I, I can send you that. That'd be brilliant, Graham. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I, I would welcome it. Um, there's a, another, Sandra, do you want to read uh, Carolyn? I'll read this. This is from Carolyn Gilbert. Uh, do you think there's any chance of incorporating principles of neuroarchitecture into city planning? Uh, and they would certainly enhance the well being and consequently community and safety. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, a wholehearted yes to that question, Caroline. Um, you know, I, you know, I think back to the late Cornelia Oberlander, who was so brilliant in in her architecture. I'm um, always thinking about um, wellness and the design of the architectural spaces that she created. Um, uh, you know, uh, Tim, her son, is a developmental pediatrician. I don't know if she explicitly or indirect or implicitly, unconsciously uh, thought about brain-based architecture in her designs. But I absolutely think um, that what the data have demonstrated and the um, architects who are now have, have really embodied this approach of brain-based architecture, they have so much to teach us. And I think all of our cities, including Vancouver, uh, need to be paying attention because they're gonna create spaces of wellness uh, <laughs> Uh, especially when we're starting to see a lot of crowding, a lot of putting greenery up on roofs rather than on the ground. And I think the brain has a lot to tell us about um, how that all that needs to evolve uh, to maximize um, brain and, and mental wellness in the future. So I love your question and it gets a emphatic yes for me. And um, if, you, if you have, I have some connections to Vancouver city planners. Um, and as soon as the, the book is actually released, I plan to be pushing it in the direction of our own of our own city, you can be sure. That was actually my follow-up question. How do we get this on the agenda of planners, architectures who are now designing spaces that are smaller and smaller, less and less green space? Uh, and how is that going to help the issues that you've talked about? Yeah. 
So I think, um, you know, uh, one sort of very, you know, tangible way is to, by publishing collections, you know, reputable mm -hmm. peer reviewed collections, like the one that will be coming out, um, written by architects, written by people from diverse backgrounds themselves. This, this particular volume, I think has 16 chapters and we have authors with Alzheimer's disease. We have authors with autism. We have authors with PTSD. It's just, it's really people on the ground, not necessarily from the from academia, who have put their voices forward to describe what's important to them in terms of keeping, uh, promoting their wellness, uh, keeping them safe and really sustaining that. And um, when the book is out, we're going to do a huge release and maybe I can count on the Emeritus College to help me get the word out. And um, again, uh, and then by being my being out and with my students and speaking about this topic, whether it's connected or disconnected from the fracking discussion, they can be separated. And um, again, engaging in you know public outreach so that the, the word is out, that there's really something to be paying attention to here. Yeah, good, thank you. Okay, next, I'm, I'm, I'm going to apologize if I don't pronounce your name right. Uh, Senya Ganu, and her comment is, surely the whole history of global col colonization is a palpable history of environmental racism. I, I don't know that anybody would argue differently. No. I so, think I think if I may say, um, really it's a way of saying that um, it's important to bring the various uh, areas of expertise together. So one of your framework references was to intercultural in the awareness of cultural elements and intercultural conversations. And there is, of course, a huge, huge study history, uh, detailed um, e examples within uh, the history of colonialism and decolonization that speak precisely the, to those sorts of issues. And, and they give us a very palpable, very direct, very concrete uh, example of the emotions and the histories involved. So it's important to bring those two areas together. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much pulled out of this slide set because I didn't I uh, think it was relevant to this group. And now, of course, I regret it. So I'll tell you what they were. Um, oh. And they're, they're a little, they're sort of the mentory, mentor in me slides. When I give this this lecture or variations on this lecture to uh, students. And in fact, I'm headed to Puerto Rico tomorrow uh, oh. to speak to a group of young neuroscience students celebrating the 30th neuroscience program in, uh, in San Juan at the university there. And the slides that I pulled out have to do with how to, with going about neuroethics in a responsible way. And I think we have to be really careful first, um, not, to, not to make it look like we're reinventing the wheel, like there's a whole history there that we're not attending to and we've just thought of something anew when in fact it's existed through time memorial. And I think that's partly what your comment refers to. And also to be careful about mission creep. And maybe, you know, Ralph Matthews will be willing to sh lend his voice in, into this conversation here, which is that I think as neuroethicists and neuroethics is a field that I started, I started with colleagues around the world. Um, the, we have to be careful because we touch on so many different aspects of ethics and we, that we have to draw on the best of different ethics frameworks. And we have to we have to assure that we bring a, a signature and a unique lens to a topic area in which we are engaging. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel of environmental neuro uh, environmental ethics, and I don't want to reinvent environmental health as if I just thought of it yesterday. I want to build on what's existed before us and bring the neuroethics focus to it. And I think um, you know always considering the history of colonialism, for example, and the importance of that speaks exactly to avoiding re redundancies and, and avoiding mission creep and assuring that we keep a distinct lens uh, on the topic and our approaches to it. So I really wanna thank you for that comment. Yeah. Ralph, are you, you wanna weigh in there? No, you don't have to. 
I want to, if I can just add first to 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 Graham's comment, <clears throat> there's there's also a, a literature which I haven't looked at in thirty years uh, around the Love Canal and right in Niagara Falls, which which was uh, it's not it's not a tourist site. It's, it's twenty thousand tons of of chemicals dumped in a canal in the in in a area that was largely with African Americans and the implications of that. Um, I, the the interesting thing for me about the environmental neuroethics, and I'm interested in the way you've taken it since I've is that it links so much. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're in the middle of a biological revolution in terms of our knowledge. We're in the middle of a cultural and social revolution in terms of our awareness of inequalities. And what we need to do is at the science level, I think, start looking at the, the literally the biological impacts in, and in the case of your field, neuroethics, uh, the epigenetic effects of environmental change. Uh, uh, another area in which I work uh, is around genomics, and we're seeing incredible short-term effects in, 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 in genes of, for example, a salmon uh, that six, weeks, six months raised in a tank before put in the ocean, and they're genetically different in 30 different ways from wild, wild salmon. If those similar effects are going on uh, across the natural science world, uh, across uh, nature, and across human impact, um, I think those those start to be important. So I, I would suggest we start looking more towards the the genetic and genomic impacts of this in terms in terms of the the socio cultural. Uh, I tend to come at the world through three issues of, of action, of culture, and of power. And what the, the comments of Sneja and others are bringing into this, I think, is the importance of looking at power and, and how, how this, uh, this, this operates uh, in terms of what actions are possible within the context that, that you've essentially presented here. Uh, what, for, the, for Priscilla, who was talking about, about the, uh, the, the issues and implications of prac fracking, I'd suggest uh, you, you're one of your slides. Fracking, and, and that has some um, implications uh, there of what 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 the implications are are for fracking? And I happen to be on that panel, so I tried to get some some insights about the social impacts. One of my favorite lines was very early on: a distinguished uh, fracking scientist in Canada said, "Well, there really is no problems where where this is happening because nobody's there." Uh, and I thought and expressed. That there are actually a lot of indigenous people who've been there for a very long time, right. and 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 we we need to we need we need to, again it's the inequality power nature culture articulation and that's far too much for me to say. Yeah. Uh, well, I really appreciate those comments, Ralph, and I would just want to honestly give a shout out to you for your partnership and collaboration with me. Um, on our early work on environmental neuroethics, I always learned so much from you and I am deeply grateful. Thank you. Um, any last questions from anyone? Okay, uh, seeing none, it's my pleasure to thank you for this journey. You started your talk by saying you're going to take us on a journey and you certainly did. And just in terms of understanding neuroethics as a foundation and environmental neuroethics as a specialization, I think that that just gave so much insight into our knowledge, this issue of two-eyed seeing, and also the deep connection of our genes, the lands change, and the whole landscape 
of sigma and under and ethics understanding. Again, uh, there are your framework for environmental neurosciences, your case studies, all really, really reflect the journey that you and your colleagues and your students, graduate students have been on and your findings that really points to the future. And that's the exciting part of this because if we certainly could tackle environmental racism, we could certainly in, in pack and tackle neural environmental neural architecture. I think we would certainly better our world in so many, so many arenas. So it is my pleasure to thank you for a, just an excellent presentation and also for learning what the future could be. And hopefully we'll be able to you let us know about your book and to support it and we wish you well. So on behalf of uh, the UVC Emeritus uh, or the Emeritus College, I wanna thank you very much. So please join me in our appreciation for Judy and her talk today. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Okay. Now the next thing that I am going to do is announce the upcoming events. <clears throat> So you see the upcoming events for December, uh, December 2nd, the photo group, and December 6th, Groves of Academy, uh, December 8th, the community volunteer group, and also on December 8th, co-housing women's group. So anybody who is interested in any of these topics, please go to our website where you certainly can register for any of our upcoming events. Our next general meeting um, is going to be on February the 8th, 2023. And we are in the process of speaking to a few speakers on completely different topics for, inter for your interest. And as soon as we finalize our speakers, we will let you know. So thanks again for attending this afternoon. And I also want to wish you all a very happy, healthy new year, happy holidays and best wishes for the new year. And we're looking forward to seeing you again at our activities in 2023. Hopefully we will be able to have more in-person uh, uh, programs and not have to rely on Zoom, but Zoom does allow us a lot, uh, allows access by people uh, from different parts of the, the province, et cetera, and the world. So thank you again, everybody.